Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to FCW Superstar Spotlight. This is going to be my new ongoing series where every episode I'm going to spotlight a different FCW superstar or diva who has never been on WWE television before. The main purpose behind this series is to basically just bring awareness to the immense level of talent that is basically just floating around in the WWE's developmental territory and what they could bring to the WWE product if and really when they're brought up. The, this series isn't necessarily like a daily thing or even a weekly thing because like I said before, I'm pretty much done with deadlines, but it will be a regular series. I'm going to be trying to update this one quite often because I am fully invested in the FCW product right now almost as much as I am in the WWE product. The format for the series is actually pretty simple. I'm going to basically have three segments. In the first segment, you're going to get a brief history of the superstar's career, some accomplishments, maybe some titles they won in FCW, that kind of thing. Then I'm going to do uh, basically a talent evaluation. I'm going to analyze what the superstar's strengths and weaknesses are. Basically, there are going to be five categories. I'll get into that a little bit later. And then the final segment of each episode is going to be my booking them into the WWE, their debut, the road to their first title, and basically what I would do with them as far as like babyface heel, how to get them over their gimmick that kind of thing so i did mention that the the second big chunk in this is going to be me giving them a talent evaluation and what i'm going to be doing is i'm going to be grading them based on five attributes five categories whatever you want to call them uh, the five categories are going to be charisma psychology intensity appearance and in-ring technical prowess uh, the first one is charisma that's pretty self-explanatory but if you don't know in my eyes charisma is how well the person basically just forces the audience to care about them uh, so if somebody has a 10 in the charisma category it's basically me saying that this guy could show up on WWE television in front of a hostile you know Chicago Philly New York City crowd cut a promo and not get booed or what chance or anything like that that is like the highest level of praise you can give somebody as far as their charisma goes uh basically a zero in charisma would be somebody that shows up starts talking and gets booed so badly that they actually stop their promo in the middle to leave because they're like crying or something i don't know uh, the second category would be psychology psychology in wrestling basically means that the guy knows how to work the crowd he knows how to make you believe that they really mean everything that they say everything that they do everything is very deliberate with them uh guys like kane cody rhodes Honestly, I think Cody Rhodes is the best example for this because his psychology is just years beyond where it needs to be at 26 years old. Kind of the antithesis would be like a guy like a John Morrison where he has the look, he has the in-ring, but his, his he has the charisma, his psychology just isn't there. He just he, he knows how to do dif different moves to get the crowd excited, but he doesn't know how to keep them invested. Uh, the third category that I'm going to be using to grade these guys is intensity. Uh, intensity to me... Now remember, this is all relatively subjective, but I'm trying to make it so that you can all relate. Intensity, in my eyes, is basically when the WWE says X-Factor or he has it, that's intensity. Uh, you can look at guys like Chris Benoit, Ultimate Warrior, Batista, Sid Justice, Sid Vicious, Psycho Sid, whatever you want to call him. Uh, even today, you have guys like Samoa Joe over in TNA or Mark Henry. Mark Henry is a great example of somebody who intensity made all the difference before because he went from smiling and happy as a baby face and then he turned heel cranked the intensity up to 10 and within months he won the world title and had one of the best world title reigns in recent memory so there's the intensity factor uh, the fourth category is obviously uh, appearance i said that that's the most artificial of the five but here's the thing i'm not saying i think a guy's hot or anything goofy like that i'm i'm, I'm straight i don't swing that way but this is my grade on the guy's appearance according to wwe standards everyone knows that the wwe likes their guys to be 6465 ripped straight shredded up, long hair, facial hair, that kind of, look. basically Triple H is the prototype here. You don't have to work as hard if you look like that compared to if you look like uh, Evan Bourne or Daniel Bryan, like a, a shorter, lighter guy with basically like a baby looking guy. That's why I brought Evan Bourne up because he kind of has that baby face look to him, but yeah. So that's appearance. The fifth and final category is something that internet marks tend to put far too much weight into, the in-run technical prowess thing. Uh, it's extremely important, don't get me wrong, but the problem is that if that's all the guy has to offer, they are not going to cut it in the WWE. 
That's why guys like, you know, Davey Richards, Roderick Strong, Amazing Red, that's why guys like that will never cut it in the big leagues because they, despite the fact that they do have great in-ring prowess and they know a lot of cool moves and stuff like that, they, they don't have the psychology, they have little to no measurable charisma, they don't have a certain look that the WWE looks for, all that stuff. So it all goes into how good the superstar on hand is. As far as the scale goes, because I am going to be grading these five categories for for each of these superstars on a scale of 0 to 10. Anything from 3 to 7 is decent. Obviously like 6 or 7 is better than 3 or 4, but anything in that range is decent. It's okay. It's not really standout good, but it's not really glaringly bad either. An 8 or higher is phenomenal. If a guy has, I already said, if a guy has an 8 in charisma or a 10 in charisma, they can cut a promo with, with the best of them, that kind of stuff. But 8 is basically as good as it gets. 8, 9, 10, that kind of range is very good. Two or lower though is one of those things where it's so bad you wouldn't even be able to cover up with the best booking everyone always says that paul Heyman was great because he was able to cover guys weaknesses up using his booking style like i say if somebody gets a two or lower in one of these categories from me it's basically my way of saying not even paul Heyman could save you now that you guys kind of have a basic idea of what's going to be going on with the series the first episode today this episode the first ever episode of fcw superstar spotlight is on who I see as being the most well-known FCW superstar right now, the son of Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, Richie Steamboat. He is only 24 years old, extremely young still, and he's got a job with the biggest company in the world. Even though he's technically still a developmental talent, he's still, he's his foot's in the door. He's there. Um, whether you want to chalk that up to talent or ability or just his name, it doesn't matter because he's in. Uh, he trained with Harley Race for a few months. He debuted in 2008 under the name Ricky Steamboat Jr., obviously trying to get the rub off of his dad's name. Uh, he trained at the Pro Wrestling Noah Dojo in early 2009 for a few months. So it's not like all his training has been just, you know, American-based. He can only do the slow Southern American style. That's not necessarily the case. He can work different styles. He debuted for FCW in February of 2010 as Richie Steamboat, so that's one consistency he's had in his time there. He held the FCW tag titles for a few months with Seth Rollins. I think he held those from like March until May last year. I don't know for sure. Uh, and he actually just had a really hot feud with somebody that you will be familiar with in Husky Harris. Uh, basically, Husky Harris, as weird as this might sound, Husky Harris is incredibly over in FCW. He's like the Stone Cold Steve Austin of that promotion. He's, you know, he's got the the attitude and he is the, the, the bad son of a gun that everybody loves to cheer for whether he's a good guy or not. So basically in that feud, Richie Steamboat basically had to play the heel. He had a little bit of a heel run there. He kind of attacked Husky Harris from behind and played up the psychology there, so he can be both a babyface or a heel, so he's not necessarily limited. Like, his dad, Ricky Steamboat, has always been a babyface. I don't think he has ever, ever been booed by anybody. He's just got the, he's got everything. He's got the charisma, but this isn't about Ricky. This is about Richie. He won the FCW 15 championship on January 13th, and he is currently still reigning as the FCW 15 champion. Now, for those of you who don't know, the FCW 15 championship was something that the FCW management created as kind of almost like their TV title. Every match has Iron Man rules, so it's a 15-minute match, and the man, after those 15 minutes, with the most pinfalls or submissions, basically with the most falls, wins the match. So, it's kind of an endurance test, so only, it's almost like a the, the big, clunky, gigantic, you know, 6'5", 300-pound guy that get blown up really easily won't be able to go after that title as easy as they would the uh, World Heavyweight Championship. So it's basically a neat way for FCW to have a cruiserweight title without having a weight limit. And I think it's brilliant because you have that time limit. So you have the guys with more endurance, like the six feet, 185 to 215 pound guys that are in really, really good shape, but not necessarily huge and bulky and shredded like the big like Batista, Mason Ryan kind of guys with the advantage there because they have the endurance. The original FCW 15 champion was Seth Rollins. He lost it to a man named Damian Sandow. I will cover both of them in future FCW Superstar Spotlights, but not this one. Uh, and then Richie Steamboat won the title from Damian Sandow. So he's only the third champion. It's not, not a very old title. It's only been around for, I think, a little over a year, maybe two. Richie Steamboat's finishing move is the super kick. 
Uh, I will say, though, just because the super kick is kind of overused in the WWE, that isn't necessarily the only thing that he can use. He has already put people away with the gory neckbreaker, which I think he should use as his finisher when he debuts for the WWE. If you don't know what the gory neckbreaker is, um, if you remember Victoria, or if you're following her now in TNA, it's Tara. She has a move that she finishes people off called the Widow's Peak. That is the gory neckbreaker, and I think that would be great for Richie Stimo to use. And then, if he goes against a giant like a Big Show or Kane or Mark Henry that he can't necessarily get up into that position, that's when the super kick will come into play. Or maybe he can throw a submission in there or something like that. I don't know. So that's that's basically Richie Stimo. There's not a whole lot to talk about as far as his career goes, because like I said, he's only 24. He's been wrestling for under four years. He's still relatively green, but he's been training for a while, and he's still pretty good in the ring. He's definitely on a higher level than most of the newer, more green guys that show up in FCW. Uh, as far as the talent evaluation goes, charisma, he has charisma but it's not off the screen amazing he's gonna be able to like i said before show up in a madison square garden cut a promo and not get booed i'm gonna give this guy a four in the charisma category maybe like a 4.55 somewhere around there he's basically just below average in the charisma category he has it but it's not good it's there he can build on it he can get better at it he can you know improve his charisma but for right now what i'm looking at on my screen yeah four four and a half something like that psychology he He's good with the psychology. He knows how to work that Southern slow style, tell the story, let the announcers, the commentators tell the story along with you. He knows how to work that style. His psychology is fairly good. I'm going to give his psychology a six and a half, maybe a seven. We'll stick with a six and a half here. Um, so, so far we have charisma, four and a half, psychology, six and a half, intensity, not very intense. He... I mean, when he was a heel, he showed a little intensity, but even then, there wasn't a ton. There was a moment when he saw Husky Harris standing over Oksana, and he thought Husky had beaten her down, and, and basically that was why he, she was on the ground and he was standing over her, and he kind of snapped a little bit there, but I would have liked to see more intensity there. Uh, intensity, I'm going to give him a four. It's not horrible to the point that if he shows up, people are going to not notice him at all. He still has intensity. He has it. It's just not, like I said with the charisma it's not going to bounce off your screen and make you just force you to pay attention so four for intensity appearance he's 6'2 230 pounds or so somewhere around there uh he has a good look he he's got the you can basically you can tell that he's his daddy's son he has the look the one thing that he doesn't have that his father always had was being ripped because Ricky Steamboat, if nothing else, was always in phenomenal shape. The guy was always ripped, always shredded. And that's not really something that Richie kind of inherited from his dad. He's a little bit softer as far as the build goes. But he still looks good. He's got that WWE look where he, he has the facial hair and the longer hair. And he... Basically, if I had to compare him to anybody, it would be CM Punk when he was doing his straight edge savior gimmick, but obviously with less, you know, knotted, ratty, unwashed hair. So appearance, I'm going to give Richie a seven and a half, 7.5. He's definitely got a good look, but he definitely isn't that main event. Holy crap, pop off the screen. He's going to be a superstar one day. He can probably, if he would get shredded and either let his hair grow out to the point that it's like Drew McIntyre length or just cut it. He'd probably bounce up into like the eight, eight and a half, nine category in, in the appearance range. But for now, 7.5 technical. He's been wrestling for less than four years, and I already said it. He is on a higher level than most of the guys that show up in FCW with some of them even with more experience. So for technical, I'm going to do a seven. He's good. He's not great yet. He's no, you know, he's no Randy Orton. He's no Bret Hart. He's not in that category as far as technical prowess goes in the ring, but he is good. Seven for technical. And uh, for each of these episodes, on top of that talent evaluation, I'm going to give a comparison to a superstar that you are more familiar with so that you can kind of know what these elements kind of add up to. And for me, the, the first guy that came to my mind when I thought Richie Steamboat 24 years old, good appearance, good technical ability, somewhat lacking in the intensity and charisma, solid psychology. The first name that comes to mind is a younger Randy Orton. Obviously, Richie Steamboat can't possibly win a world title at 24 because he's already 24 and he hasn't even debuted yet, but he still has that potential to be that guy who's going to be showing up at a very young age and winning titles. And basically, it'll get to a point that people are saying, God, Richie Steamboat's been around for so long. I'm so sick of him, just like with Randy Orton. And then 
I'll turn around and say, he's only 30 or 31 or 32 or even 29 or whatever, how old he will be, years old, and you're already complaining about him. Because that's how I feel like Randy Orton is. People get sick of him. Oh, he wins too much. He's had so many world titles and he's been around too long. Give the young guys a chance. And I'm like, seriously, he is a young guy. Randy Orton's 31. He was... I think he was 22 when he debuted in the WWE, so he was younger than Richie is now, but I still feel like Richie has that kind of potential. I don't think he has the, the ceiling that Randy Orton has always had, because he's not that star, like that amazing top star. As far as top level potential goes, I could see Richie Steamboat being like a uh, I want to say like a Kurt Angle kind of heel almost, or or maybe a Chris Benoit kind of guy. As far as in ring, he, he, he can kind of get everything down pat. I don't ever see him being on that top star level like a Rock or Orton or Cena or Austin or even Hart or Michaels or anything like that but he has the potential to be that number two very solid backup to move on as far as how I would debut Richie Steamboat he's a second generation guy so it kind of writes itself his dad is Ricky Steamboat everybody knows Ricky Steamboat everybody loves Ricky Steamboat have his father come out and introduce him as a babyface Richie debuts as a babyface but he can't win matches he loses and loses and loses and it works because it lets the WWE Universe see how technically sound he is so he isn't winning matches but he still he sells well he's good with the psychology game just like I said I gave him a 6.5 in psychology he's got the technical thing down those are all things that the WWE Universe can pick up on. They're not going to say, oh my goodness, that was such a smooth transition. That was unbelievable. But they will be like, dang, this guy's holding his own against these guys that he's going against that I've already been familiar with for months or years. So Richie, basically, he goes on a losing streak. Months just three four maybe even five or six months of him just doing nothing but losing every time he shows up on tv there's all this hype he's happy he's high-fiving the fans he gets this big smile on his face he gets in the ring he holds his own but he never wins then one night you have him cut out and cut his first promo he basically turns heel during this promo he says i'm not my father i'm not gonna follow the same path he did you people shouldn't expect me to be as good as him or as you know whatever as him i've got a car of my own path i'm better than my father ever was you would still rather cheer him than me it doesn't make sense i'm done begging for your approval i'm done talking it's time for actions basically leading up to him saying he's going to start winning matches one after another after another and his main prize is the the prize that his father always cherished the most the intercontinental championship so we already have it established now that richie steamboat doesn't want to appeal to the hip fans anymore he thinks he's better than his father he wants to prove he's better than his father and he's going to do so by winning the intercontinental championship that storyline essentially writes itself but i'll go a little bit further we'll have him cut that heel promo right before a match and the match that he would go into then after the promo he wins so he he turns heel and then he starts winning he wins pretty much every match have him start from the bottom have him beat uh i don't know maybe like a tyson kid maybe a trent beretta if these guys are all still around of course maybe you have him beat a kurt hawkins or a tyler rex those like basically jobbers and then have him work his way up maybe go through a, a santino and a zach Ryder and kind of like those lower mid card guys that people cheer for and get behind and then eventually you want to put him into a program with the intercontinental champion obviously michael cole can be used for this because he's so great at getting over heels he can basically come out and say ever since he abandoned the wwe universe he's been doing nothing but winning good for you richie you're awesome and then eventually with all this build and depending on how the audience reacts and hopefully they would be receptive to it he would win the intercontinental championship so there is basically a jump start for richie steamboat's career and that was it that's what i would do i would I think he's great as far as the technical, the appearance, the psychology. He's lacking in charisma. He's lacking in intensity, but not too badly that you can't have him on TV. He's good at just about everything. He's not phenomenal or great at pretty much anything. At this point, he reminds me of a young 22 to 23 year old Randy Orton. He can play off the cocky heel gimmick. He wants to be better than his dad, that kind of stuff. I think that one of the big attributes that this guy has that is very, very good, it's it's an asset, is that he can be both a 
heel or a face. And him as a face is never going to fail because of who his dad is. And him being a, a heel can't fail either because people expect him to be a face. So if he comes out and he turns heel, it's going to take people by surprise. They're going to be offended and they're going to boo him even more. So there you have it. That's Richie Steamboat. This has been the first ever edition of the FCW Superstar Spotlight. We have a potential Intercontinental Championship reign for a second generation superstar. And yeah, I will say it. Richie Steamboat does have that potential to eventually make it to that level where he'll hold the world title or the WWE title for a few months in between the bigger names holding the titles. Next time on FCW Superstar Spotlight, the spotlight will be on none other than Seth Rollins. Subscribe, like, favorite, and follow me on Twitter. Check out TwitWow free on iTunes. And of course, buy the t-shirt. I'm Ian Izzle, signing out.